God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The world before the great flood was a place of immense mystery and intrigue. It was a world vastly different from ours, a world shrouded in darkness and rife with secrets. The story of Cain and Abel stands as the first recorded conflict in human history, a tragic tale of jealousy and murder that set the stage for a world teetering on the brink of chaos. Cain, the firstborn son of Adam and Eve, offered God the fruits of the soil, while his brother Abel offered the firstborn of his flock. God favored Abel's offering, and this divine preference ignited a lethal envy in Cain's heart. Driven by jealousy, Cain lured Abel into the field and murdered him. This act of fratricide led to Cain's curse, marking him and casting him away as a restless wanderer. But what of the Nephilim? These enigmatic giants are briefly mentioned in Genesis 6 verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Who were these beings, and what role did they play in the pre-flood world? Were they fallen angels, demigods, or something else entirely? Their influence on humanity was profound and perilous, contributing to the moral decay that led to the flood. Imagine a world where divine beings walked among men, where the boundaries between the mortal and the divine were blurred. The Nephilim, with their immense stature and power, must have appeared godlike to the people of that time. Their presence added to the corruption and violence that filled the earth, hastening God's decision to cleanse the world with a great flood. What do you think life was like before the flood? Do you believe the Nephilim were a real historical phenomenon? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to check out our other videos and join our channel for more intriguing explorations into biblical mysteries. Jacob's Ladder and he dreamed, and behold a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Jacob's dream of a ladder reaching to heaven is one of the most vivid and spiritually significant visions in the Bible. This story unfolds when Jacob, fleeing from his brother Esau, finds himself alone in the wilderness. Esau was furious with Jacob for stealing his blessing, so Jacob had to leave his home and travel to his uncle Laban's house. It was during this journey, feeling tired and vulnerable, that Jacob stopped to rest. He took a stone and used it as a pillow, lying down to sleep on the ground under the vast sky. It was there, in the stillness and solitude of the night, that Jacob had a remarkable vision that would change his life forever. In his dream, Jacob saw a ladder, or more accurately, a stairway, that stretched from the earth all the way up to heaven. This ladder wasn't just a simple wooden structure, it was a grand, celestial staircase, gleaming and majestic. Angels of God were moving up and down the ladder, ascending and descending between heaven and earth. This continuous movement of angels signifies a constant connection and communication between the divine and the earthly realms. At the top of the ladder stood the Lord himself, who spoke to Jacob. God reaffirmed the covenant he had made with Jacob's grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac. He promised Jacob that his descendants would be as numerous as the dust of the earth and that through his offspring, all the families of the earth would be blessed. This promise was not only about a multitude of descendants but also about a special relationship with God and a future of hope and blessing. This ladder symbolizes the connection between heaven and earth, a bridge between the divine and the human. In Christian theology, Jacob's ladder is often seen as a prefiguration of Jesus Christ, who is viewed as the ultimate bridge between God and humanity. In the Gospel of John, Jesus himself alludes to this vision when he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This statement connects Jacob's dream directly to Jesus, highlighting Jesus as the way through which humanity can reach God. The spiritual significance of Jacob's ladder lies in its representation of the continuous movement and connection between the divine and the earthly realms. It serves as a powerful reminder that God is always present and active in our lives, guiding and protecting us, even when we are unaware of it. The angels moving up and down the ladder symbolize God's constant care and attention to our needs. They remind us that there is always a way to reach God, and that He is always reaching out to us. Jacob's experience at Bethel, which means, House of God, also marked a significant moment of transformation in his life. When Jacob awoke from his dream, he was filled with awe and fear. He said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. He realized that he had been in the presence of God. He took the stone he had used as a pillow and set it up as a pillar, pouring oil on top of it to consecrate it. He called the place Bethel, and he made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me I will give you a tenth. Jacob's vow at Bethel signifies his commitment to follow God and to recognize God's presence and blessing in his life. It was a turning point where Jacob, who had been a deceiver, started to transform into a man of faith. Jacob's ladder is not just a story from ancient times, it holds profound meaning for us today. It encourages us to recognize the presence of God in our lives and to understand that we are never alone. The vision of angels ascending and descending reminds us that there is always a path to connect with God, and that He is constantly involved in our lives, guiding us and helping us.
Moreover, this story invites us to think about the ways we experience divine connection in our own lives. How do we see God reaching out to us? How do we respond to His presence? Do we recognize the Bethels in our lives, the moments and places where we feel God's presence strongly? Jacob's ladder challenges us to be aware of the divine in the mundane, to see the holy in the ordinary moments of our lives. What does Jacob's ladder mean to you? Do you see it as a symbol of hope, a promise of divine connection, or perhaps something else? How do you experience the connection between heaven and earth in your own life? Share your interpretations and thoughts in the comments below, and let's explore this profound biblical story together. Join the conversation and let's dive deeper into the mysteries of our faith. The Three Heavens I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth winky face such an one caught up to the third heaven. The idea of the three heavens is a fascinating and complex topic in biblical cosmology. The Bible often refers to heaven, but it doesn't always mean the same thing. According to scripture, the term heaven can actually refer to three distinct realms. The first heaven is what we see when we look up during the day. This is the atmospheric heaven, the sky where birds fly and clouds form. It's the blue expanse that we gaze upon and where we see the sun, moon, and stars at night. This is the realm that is closest to us, the one we experience daily. The second heaven is the celestial heaven, the vast space where stars, planets, and other celestial bodies reside. This is the realm of the cosmos, the infinite expanse that astronomers study with telescopes. It's where galaxies spin and constellations form pictures in the sky. The celestial heaven is much further away from us than the atmospheric heaven and is full of wonders that continue to astonish us as we learn more about the universe. The third heaven, often referred to as the highest heaven or the heaven of heavens, is the divine realm where God dwells. This is a place of indescribable beauty and holiness, far beyond human comprehension. It is the ultimate paradise, the throne room of God, where His will is perfectly done. In his second letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul speaks of a man who was caught up to the third heaven. He experienced visions and revelations that were beyond human comprehension. Paul says, I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth winky face such an one caught up to the third heaven. This third heaven is the ultimate destination for believers, a place of eternal peace and joy in the presence of God. Understanding the three heavens helps to clarify many biblical passages that mention heaven. For instance, when Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven, he is referring to the divine realm where God's will is perfectly done. This is the third heaven, the highest heaven. On the other hand, when the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God, it is speaking of the celestial heaven, with its myriad stars and galaxies that testify to the Creator's majesty. The distinction between these realms also enriches our understanding of spiritual warfare. The book of Daniel describes a spiritual battle in the heavenly realms, where angelic beings contend against forces of darkness. This battle takes place in the second heaven, the celestial realm. It highlights the idea that there are layers of reality beyond our physical perception, where spiritual forces are at work. The first heaven, our sky, is often mentioned in the context of weather and natural phenomena. For example, in Genesis, the creation story describes how God created the heavens and the earth. The first heaven is where the birds fly and where rain comes from. When the Bible talks about the windows of heaven being opened, as in the story of Noah's flood, it's referring to this first heaven. The second heaven, the celestial heaven, is full of wonders that ancient people could see but not fully understand. Today, with advanced technology, we have explored this heaven more than ever before. We've sent telescopes and spacecraft to explore the stars, planets, and galaxies. This realm shows the vastness of God's creation, stretching our understanding and leaving us in awe of His power and creativity. The third heaven, the divine realm, is more mysterious. It's described as a place of incredible beauty and peace, where God reigns supreme. This is the heaven that believers aspire to reach, a place of eternal life and joy. In Revelation, John describes his vision of this heaven, with streets of gold, gates of pearl, and a river of life flowing from the throne of God. It's a place where there is no more pain, sorrow, or death. Understanding these three heavens helps us see the fullness of God's creation and His plan for us. It reminds us that there is more to life than what we can see and touch. There are spiritual realities and divine plans at work beyond our immediate experience. Have you ever wondered about the nature of heaven? Do you think about what it might be like to witness the glory of the celestial heaven or to experience the peace of the divine heaven? How do you envision these different realms of heaven? Share your thoughts and interpretations in the comments below, and let's engage in a deeper discussion about the mysteries of the heavens. Your insights and questions can help us all grow in our understanding. By sharing and discussing, we can support each other on our spiritual journeys. Don't forget to watch our other videos and join our channel, Celestial Chronicles, for more explorations into biblical mysteries. Your participation is what makes our community special. Until next time, keep seeking the truths hidden within the sacred scriptures. The 24 Elders And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold.
The mysterious 24 elders in the Book of Revelation have long intrigued and puzzled readers and scholars alike. Their identity and role are not explicitly defined, leading to much speculation and debate among theologians. These elders are vividly described as sitting around the throne of God, dressed in white garments and wearing golden crowns on their heads. They are actively involved in the heavenly worship and the governance of divine matters. So, who are these 24 elders? One popular interpretation is that they represent the 12 tribes of Israel from the Old Testament and the 12 apostles from the New Testament. This view symbolizes the unity and continuity of God's covenant with his people across both testaments. It suggests that the elders embody the entire redeemed community, spanning from the earliest believers in Israel to the followers of Christ. Another interpretation posits that these elders are angelic beings. This idea stems from their proximity to God's throne and their significant roles in the heavenly court. Angels frequently appear in the Bible as God's messengers and servants, performing vital tasks and delivering divine messages. The notion that the 24 elders could be a special class of angels involved in the governance and worship of heaven is compelling. The presence of the 24 elders around the throne is highly symbolic. It indicates a structured and organized divine governance. Their position and actions show that they play an essential role in carrying out God's will and maintaining heavenly order. One of their most striking actions is casting their crowns before the throne. This gesture signifies their acknowledgement of God's supreme authority and sovereignty. By laying down their crowns, they demonstrate their humility and submission to the Almighty, recognizing that all honor and glory belong to God alone. The number 24 itself holds significant symbolism. It could represent completeness and perfection in divine governance. The combination of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles sums up the entirety of God's people, signifying the full scope of his redemptive plan. Alternatively, the number 24 might reflect the orderly and perfect arrangement within the heavenly court, mirroring the flawless order of God's kingdom. The 24 elders are not mere bystanders in the heavenly realm, they are actively involved in the events and judgments described in Revelation. They hold golden bowls filled with incense, which symbolize the prayers of the saints. This imagery highlights the importance of prayer in the divine plan and shows that the prayers of believers are cherished and valued in heaven. The elders' role in presenting these prayers to God underscores their mediating function and their participation in the worship and intercession for humanity. Furthermore, the 24 elders are depicted singing a new song of redemption, celebrating the Lamb's victory over sin and death. This song is a powerful proclamation of Christ's triumph and the fulfillment of God's salvation plan. The elders' participation in this song of redemption reflects their deep involvement in the rejoicing and worship that accompany the Lamb's victory. The identity and role of the 24 elders continue to be a topic of fascination and discussion. Are they symbolic of the church, representing the entire community of believers throughout history? Are they angelic beings with a unique role in the heavenly court? Or could they be something else entirely, a divine mystery yet to be fully understood? What do you think the 24 elders represent? Do you lean towards the idea that they symbolize the combined body of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, representing all of God's redeemed people? Or do you see them as a special class of angelic beings with significant roles in heaven? Perhaps you have another interpretation or insight into their identity and purpose. Share your thoughts and insights in the comments below, and let's engage in a rich and enlightening discussion about this fascinating aspect of the book of Revelation. Thank you for exploring this profound mystery with us. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the identity of the 24 elders, be sure to watch our other videos and join our channel, Celestial Chronicles, for more in-depth explorations and discussions of biblical mysteries. Your participation and insights are what make this community vibrant and engaging. Until next time, keep seeking the truths hidden within the sacred scriptures. Thank you for delving into these biblical mysteries with us. If you enjoyed this exploration, be sure to watch our other videos and join our channel, Celestial Chronicles, for more in-depth studies and discussions. Your participation and insights are what make this community special. Until next time, keep seeking the truths hidden within the sacred scriptures.